Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise to speak in support of the amendment brought forward by my colleague from Cowichan Valley, the amendment to uh, send a Bill 10 uh, to the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services for further review and deliberations. Let me see if I can articulate, in the words of the Minister of Agriculture, exactly why this is important to do so. The Minister of Agriculture, back in April the 6th, 2016, said this, and this was in reference to the BC Liberals at the time. They are creating reckless legislation which, in my mind, as someone who has always been an environmentalist, is absolutely reckless, irresponsible and disappointing. They are creating this le reckless legislation. They are sweetening the deal as much as they possibly can, treating LNG like a lost leader in a department store. Oh, how those words ring so very true right now. Those words ring so very true, but no, Honourable Speaker, it is not with reference to the BC Liberals. It is with reference to this government of which the Minister of Agriculture is a member. We go to others who have spoken forward. We go to the Minister of Energy, Mines and Petroleum Resources, who has come up with some remarkable zingers while she was in opposition. It's just utterly ridiculous and irres irresponsible and reprehensible to sell out British Columbians for the next 25 years, not just for this industry, but potentially others as well, she says. People in my part of the world, that would be Nelson, view the environment and long-term environmental sustainable planning as one of the top priorities that any government should be considering, and that is not reflected in Bill 30 at the time. What is reflected, rather, is a desperate, desperate grasp at any deal put in front of them because promises were made in an election. Now, Honourable Speaker, as I articulated yesterday in further deliberations <laughs> at second reading and in support of my, both my amendment, my reason amendment, and my colleague from Saanich North and the Islands amendment, attempted amendment, unsuccessful one, to uh, hoist this. What is before us now is an amendment to send this to committee. To send us to committee is important for a couple of reasons. We've heard a lot about the so-called benefits of LNG. We've heard about $23 billion of investment, and we've been told to trust us. We know that's true, but we're not going to share that publicly because we've signed an agreement with a company. The government is not willing to put before this legislature the detailed agreement that we are supposed to be supporting. We know that by going to committee, and only if this were to be sent to committee, would we be able to reflect and further quiz as a legislature, government and proponents, about the details of the plan. It's an eminently reasonable suggestion. We've waited for so long, yet now we're being rushed in two days to try to deliver what Christy Clark couldn't. In essence, that's the stick. Here's what happened, Honourable Speaker. After the last election, I'm sure LNG Canada were a little antsy because the Liberals left and they were champions of LNG, unicorns, Tooth fairies all in your backyard, Maseratis for each and all of us, $100 billion prosperity fund. That was the Liberal dream. When the LNG Canada, when that election happened, they were probably a little, little hurting. So here's what I'm pretty certain happened. A bunch of executives walked into the newly formed NDP government office and said this, we're going to leave unless you do this, 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 that, and this, and this, and this. And the NDP government's response was, OK, OK, let's just do it. Let's not reflect upon what the numbers are that you're suggesting. We'll believe it at face value. And so here now we have before us a motion to send this to committee to allow, for the first time, this legislature to probe the proponent, to probe government as to the numbers, the ret rhetoric that's thrown out there, the numbers, to probe to see to what extent those numbers are actually grounded in evidence. To the credit of the BC Liberals, 
We actually had that opportunity with the Petronas Agreement. And as I recalled yesterday, time after time, MLA after MLA, hurled abuse and vitriol at the BC Liberals. These are NDP MLAs doing that because they didn't like what they saw in the Petronas Agreement. Yet here before us, the BC NDP take that, take that corporate welfare, take that to a whole new le level. The blog post I'll be writing later today, Honourable Speaker, describes it as this. This is corporate welfare on steroids. On steroids, Honourable Speaker. We've already given $6 billion in deep well royalty credit, cre credits to the natural gas producers. We already know that this is an industry for which there's a glut of natural gas globally, where Iran has 20 times all of Canada's supply, where Russia has 20 times all of Canada's supply, where Australia already has LNG fields that are not being developed because the market is not there for them. We know that the U.S. has three times the shale gas of Canada alone. We know that Louisiana already has clean, clean compression, electric compressors, compressions. Yet we know that this government doesn't really like that because they want to refer to LNG Canada as the cleanest in the world and exempt them from the, from the carbon tax. Exempt them from the carbon tax increases above $30 because they'll redefine what clean is and forget about the fact that there are electric compressions elsewhere. But most importantly, what this committee needs to reflect upon is not just the so-called benefits, but the actual costs. What is the cost to the desertification of Southern Europe? What is the cost of the extinction of 80% of species on this planet being committed to extinction by the end of this century? These are the questions that MLAs in government need to look and ask themselves. They can put their faces in their paper. They can stay away from the chamber. We don't even have quorum here on government side in the chamber because they're afraid to hear the truth. They're hate, afraid to hear the truth. We have quorum in total. We don't have it on the government side in terms of the number of people. We do have quorum. I'm not calling quorum, Honourable Speaker. It's there. But frankly, we don't have the government MLAs here that's supposed to deliver us the quorum because they're afraid to actually have to listen to the cold, hard truth about what they're going to support. 80% species extinction this century globally because of global warming. Commitment to six meters sea level rise because of global warming. Vector-borne diseases moving northward because of global warming. Forest fires like we've never seen before because of global warming. Drought, famine because of global warming. Frankly, Honourable Speaker, the end of Western civilization because of global warming. Yet, here in this chamber, we think it's a balancing act. We need a couple of jobs, 100 jobs, and we need to subsidize a multinational fossil fuel company that has no interest in British Columbia, Honourable Speaker, but is interested in filling the coffers of the shareholders in Bahamas, the Cayman Islands, perhaps in Netherlands. Yet this is being done for the goodness of the people of British Columbia. Nobody talks about the cost. Nobody's talking about the cost. And let us be very clear. This is what BC NDP MLAs will be voting for today. They will be voting for putting this province on the pathway to join the biggest subsidizers of the fossil fuel industry in the world and to put us on a path to become from climate le leaders to climate laggards. Very serious accusation, Honourable Speaker. But you do not tell British Columbians that you must cut your emissions by 90 per cent by 2050. Sorry, 98 per cent. Every British Columbian must cut their emissions by 98 per cent by 2050 to meet our target. But LNG Canada, you're good because we are going to let you add four megatons and then they're going to add another two trains later this decade. This is what we're doing. Every other British Columbian, all the good hard work of every British Columbian in this province is for naught. It's for naught because this government, these NDP MLAs, who stood in the last election and had the gall, Honourable Speaker, yes, the gall, to look British Columbians in the face and say, we are environmentalists. 
We care about your future. We care about the climate. We care about the children's future. And yes, I am evoking the children's future because that is the very reason why I got into this building in the first place. I could not stand by in 2013 after witnessing the now finance minister who was former leader of this party run an ax the tax campaign in 2009, a cynical, cynical campaign to undermine efforts to move us forward to cut emissions. I could not stand by and watch what happened in 2013. And it was tough running as a BC Green Honourable Speaker. It was tough because the NDP sent in their hundreds of union workers to doorknock in Oak Bay because they didn't want a beachhead. They switched the famous, famous uh, weather vane switch on Kinder Morgan because they were about environmental support. They're going around meeting with environmental groups saying, we're here for you. But when actual legislation is before us, the true colours of the BC NDP are revealed. They are not interested in the well-being of future generations. They are interested in the well-being of their friends, their union workers, and frankly, their re-election. So I say, Honourable Speaker, to the NDP MLAs who vote for this, shame on you and don't you for one second ever come to me and say you are supporting climate change action in this province because this vote today, this singular vote today, will undermine all the good efforts, all the good efforts contained in Clean BC because we will add four megatons of emissions, the single biggest point source of emissions in Canadian history to British Columbia's emissions trajectory. We will add 15 per cent increase in emissions because of a four-train LNG facility. And don't get me wrong, the pretense and the half-truths being told to the BC public about this being only a two-train facility is nothing more than idle rhetoric, because we know the environmental assessment process has already approved four trains for LNG Canada, and that's eight megatons of emissions. So any NDP MLA who stands up and votes for this, there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day of reckoning not only by the electorate, but also by history. Historical books will be written, and this time will feature big and large in the history books. This time in British Columbia where we had a choice to make. We have two paths and two roads. One road is the road that we've tried so very hard to get the NDP to get behind, and they have in some sense. The road to recognize that innovation in the 21st century is the foundation of a vibrant, resilient, strong economy for that 21st century. That is where our strengths are. We build on our strategic strengths. We don't chase the weaknesses of others. And it is only through sending this to committee that we will be able to explore this in further detail, which is why this amendment must be supported by BCNDP and hopefully some BC Liberal members, because I know there's uncomfort over there as well. We're not asking much here, Honourable Speaker. My colleague from Cowichan Valley is simply asking that we as legislators do our due diligence. We have a duty and responsibility to future generations to ensure we reflect upon the true costs of what's coming before us, not just the idle rhetoric that is untested with no foundations and no evidence that somehow this is $23 billion, not because the Premier gets to stand up and say, I got to do what Christy Clark couldn't. Those are not reasons. History will not be kind to this government. This government will be short-lived, and history will judge it accordingly. They'll judge it as betraying an entire generation. What we saw today in question period, Honourable Speaker, is really a microcosm of the bigger issue. We saw in question period haggling back and forth across the aisles. We didn't do ride-hailing. You didn't do ride-hailing. You're bad. We're bad. Oh, make fun of you. You make fun of us. The reality is none of the people in this place did anything about ride-hailing. It's only because of the BC Green Caucus that we've got to where we are and the t countless hours we've put in to drive this government to insist upon standing committees meeting, to insist upon uh, bringing in regulations that would allow ride-hailing, to insist upon the introduction of, a, of a, an amendment that my colleague brought forward in the fall. And if that amendment had not passed, we wouldn't even be here talking <laughs> because we know that both ride-hailing major companies would have walked if it were not for that amendment passing. So, Honourable Speaker, we continue to work hard with this government to try to advance good public policy. But here we throw up our hands. We throw up our hands in disbelief at the cognitive dissonance embodied by the NDP right now. 
as they stand up and claim to be there for the environment. They claim and have the gall to talk about the future generations. To see NDP MLAs clamoring over each other to get stuck in a Photoshop with the young children demonstrating here on the steps, it's enough to make you want to throw up, Honorable Speaker. It honestly is, because it is sickening to the core when the hypocrisy of the BC NDP MLAs standing with those children, pleading for decision makers, pleading for them to look out for their interests, because we have a global movement of youth calling upon our leaders to stand up and actually put their interests in the decision maker, because they're not here to be able to vote. They're not part of our decision-making process, yet they live the consequences of the decisions we make. And none of us in this room, not a single one of us, Honourable Speaker, in this room will have to live the consequence of the decision we're making today. That consequence will manifest itself on the future generations, and God help them with the world we are leaving behind because of our irresponsible and utterly reckless approach to energy policy. I had hope in this government, Honourable Speaker. I had hope when I saw Clean BC that this government actually got it. But what I see now is they are no different. I would pull out a coin and flip it, but that would be considered a prop. What I would say by that is we have one coin in this house. We have one coin with two sides, and they're exactly the same on both sides. Ironically, the BC NDP take the Liberal giveaway to a whole new level. So I might add some additional colour to that and suggest we have a fiscally irresponsible version of the same LNG cheerleaders over here because they've taken the level of corporate level, level welfare to a whole new level. That again, coming back to this motion, is precisely why it is so critical. It is so critical that we send this, member, this, this bill to committee to ensure that the legislature, all of us, can actually reflect upon the decision we're making. Has there ever once in the history of this legislature ever been an expert, an expert climate scientist pulled in front of a committee and said, tell us, what are the ramifications of our decision on future generations? I safely say no. How many times have you pulled in an economist and said, how much would our GDP change three years from now? I'd say a lot. How often in decision making that happens here do we think about Will I get re-elected because of this? An awful lot. In fact, I would say it fa fairly, fa feel it fairly safe to say that the most people in this place, sadly, are more interested in their re-election than they are in actually putting in place good public policy that will ensure that future generations <laughs> inherit the quality of the environment that we were blessed to inherit from our forefathers. Yet here today, we are at this pivotal, pivotal, pivotal moment. It's a moment that I ask each and every MLA to reflect upon, as my colleague from Cowan Churn Valley so beautifully articulated. Why are we here? What is a Westminster parliamentary democracy? What is our role as an MLA? Is it to dutifully stand like sheep because our whip tells us we must vote, vote this way? I've sat here for six years now, probably seen people vote against the party two times. Three times, maybe. One of them was when my colleagues and I shared a difference of opinion on a vote. No other time. Why do we elect 41 NDP MLAs? Why bother? We should only elect three of them. They all say the same thing. They all do the same thing. They all stand like sheep and sing out. I mean, we don't see any kind of negative rhetoric coming about this bill, even though, again, I could go on with my 20 pages of quotes here. I could read more quotes, but I'm not going to because we've got the point. The point is hypocrisy like we've never seen before. This government should be ashamed of itself. Those NDP MLAs who vote for this should be ashamed of themselves. The member opposite says I should be heckled. No, I'm, I'm, I think that that's unfair. This is a very serious, a very, very serious point that's being raised. I'm appealing to you as well. Why are you not standing up? Why are you, the member from some Delta North, why are member. you not thinking? Of, you're a farmer. Member. Why member. Are, so let's, let's see. Sorry, no. I'm through the chair. Thank you. I understand. Why, why are we not having the agriculture community? The Minister of Agriculture. The Minister of Agriculture, of all people, I've already read a quote, who would stand up, who would stand up and argue 
in an election campaign that no, 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 you've got to vote NDP because we're there for the environment. The Minister of Transportation, same thing. I don't know how many times on the campaign trail I had to listen to the vote split narrative. Oh, I'd love to vote Green, but I'm voting NDP, and you know what? They're good for the environment too. Well, today is that day of reckoning. Show us. Show us what your really true colors are. Are your true colors that you are a progressive party, one that cares about the future generations, or really are you no different from the BC Liberals? It's just the other side of the same coin. And how do you want to be remembered? And I'll leave it with this. How do you want to be remembered in history? Do you want history books to pick up and turn the page and see the member, the member, the NDP member from this jurisdiction or that? And I know which jurisdictions you're feeling it from your constituents, because I'm getting copies of every single email going out. And I know there's some MLAs who are hearing it from their constituency. And I know that those same MLAs, if they actually voted their conscience, would stand up and support their constituents and vote with this motion to send it to standing committee, because we know that that's what their constituent wants. Not all. I suspect the member from Peace River North is in pretty safe ground. There seems to be cognitive dissonance out there mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that we're talking about, we're talking about forest fires, we're talking about the, the, the caribou preservation, and we're not putting the dots together. Why do you think we're having forest fires, for goodness sake? In 2004, I wrote a paper with Nathan Gillett and Mike Flanagan, for, uh, or sorry, um, yeah, Mike Flanagan, uh, where the first time we were able to detect Forest fires are already increasing because of global warming. We knew that in 2004, for heaven's sakes, 14 years ago. And we just, what's the government's response? Oh, we need more funny money to fight fires. No, you got the wrong response. What you should be doing is reckon that climate change is a very, very real threat. And fighting fires is no good. You must prevent fires in the first place, but we don't think that way in this place. We're too narrowly focused on re-election, short-term decisions, and we're too narrowly focused on What's in it for me, and how do I get a quick win? Nobody, other than at least three here, are thinking about the long-term consequences of the decisions here on future generations. That is a shame, Honourable Speaker. So with that, I hope, I hope NDP MLAs and Liberal MLAs do some soul-searching here as they think about this amendment and ask whether it is really that big a deal to send this to committee to allow the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services, I think is the name of it, to actually reflect upon it, call in some expert testimony, and make a recommendation as to whether or not this is actually in the triple bottom line sense good for British Columbians, because I suggest to you that it's not. I suggest to you, to you that it's hard to have a vibrant economy on a dead planet, and I would suggest to you that we are putting ourselves on right that pathway and rather than recognizing the opportunity, we are doing the very best we can to put us on this pathway to extinction. Is that what we want here? I know it's a big reach from one LNG facility to extinction. I recognize that. But what is important is to recognize that Canada is a signatory to the Paris Accord. And the Paris Accord says that the global leaders, of which Canada is a signatory, of which our Minister of Environment was very proud to fly off to Paris and have photo ops, says that we're going to do steps, take steps, to commit warming to su substantially below two degrees. Forget the one and a half degrees, that's long toast, but substantially below two degrees. And what does that mean, as I said yesterday? The direct translation of that policy statement is that there can be no new investment in fossil fuel infrastructures effective immediately. Because you don't build a four to two or four train LNG facility to tear it down in five years. We have a legislated target of 80% greenhouse gas reductions by 2050, and we want to add four megatons, which will go to eight when you get four trains, by 2030. That's a 15% increase on all of BC emissions, yet we have a legislated target to take us to 80% reductions. That means every British Columbian must reduce their emissions 98%. Now, I'm pretty close to zero emissions as it is, Honourable Speaker, but I challenge you to find every other person in the province go to 98% emissions. It's going to be tough, and we're making it tougher. So let us, let us look upon this upcoming vote 
Let us look upon this upcoming moat and let's think about this so, with somber reflection. Because a vote to not send this to committee is nothing short of a betrayal of future generations, is nothing short of a betrayal to the voters of British Columbia, and is nothing short of a betrayal to the fiscal well-being of this province as we put another corporate steroid on corporate uh, subsidy on steroids to a fading fossil fuel industry that would not otherwise go on here in British Columbia, while at the same time, and this is what I'm so sad about, while at the same time missing out those incredible opportunities for innovation in the north, incredible opportunities that we could have. I don't know how many times we brought forward ideas for the North. Thank goodness we're actually getting broadband redundancy in Prince George now. Waited for the BC Liberals for doing that for years. We're finally getting investment in broadband redundancy. We should be getting the tech sector together with the resource sector. We should be building on our forest sector. We shouldn't be giving away our resources. We should be thinking about all of this through the lens of climate change adaptation and mitigation because that is the defining issue of our time that many of you will be judged and you will be judged negatively. So with that, Honourable Speaker, I ask and I plead with the members of this House, vote in support of this amendment. You're only sending it to committee for further deliberation. Thank you for your time.